ports are visible. It's okay. Not immediately after us, maybe. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. It's great to be back in ICTP after several years. So, my <coughs> lectures will be on Dean Stunt on FX and String Theory. So, let me write this. Is this writing visible from the back? Okay, thank you. And I should also say that please ask questions whenever you have any instead of waiting till the end. So let me begin by just saying a few words about string theory, okay, and then I'll come to Dean Stanton's. So the original formulation of string theory was perturbative. So original formulation is perturbative, okay. which means that we have an algorithm to generate a perturbation expansion of various quantities. Okay. So in particular, if you are given some background, okay. and this background is given in the form of a 2D CFT, okay. or you can think of this also as a compactification. So what we can compute is the following. That first, the spectrum of states. Which typically contain a few massless fields and infinite tower of massive fields, massive states, few massless and infinite tower of massive states. And the other thing we can compute is scattering amplitudes involving these states. But when I say that we can compute this, we can compute this only in a, uh, as a perturbation series. Okay. So let's take the example of a uh, case, uh, case of scattering amplitudes. Okay. So this typically has the form, so the scattering amplitudes okay. in string theory are expressed as a sum So this GS is what is called the string coupling, and the expansion is in parts of GS. This is some constant, okay, some integer typically, or sometimes, yeah, mostly it's integer in perturbation theory. Okay. And these are the non-trivial objects. These contain information about the scattering amplitude, these are functions of the quantum number of the state, of the external states, which includes momentum, for example. Okay. 
and string theory tells you how to calculate these. Okay, at least it gives an algorithm for how to calculate these. Okay. And the algorithm involves integrals over moduli spaces of Riemann surfaces. Now, if you haven't seen this before, you don't worry too much about it, right? because you will not use this explicitly. Okay? We will encounter some integrals of this kind, but that I'll, uh, those will be uh, uh, reasonably simple kind. Okay? And I'll explain when they come along. Okay? But this is a general framework of string theory that we have a way to calculate scattering amplitudes as a perturbation expansion in the coupling. Okay? And the coefficients of expansion are computable according to fixed algorithm. And that algorithm involves you have to do integrals, certain integrals over moduli spaces of Riemann surfaces. Okay. Now, from quantum field theory, we know that there is more to it than perturbation expansion. Okay. So, in QFT, we have additional contributions. non perturbative contributions okay terms which cannot be which uh, basically whose Taylor series expansion vanishes to all orders okay so this is why they are not captured in perturbation expansion And we expect that similar effects also exist in string theory. Similar terms to be present in string theory. In quantum field theory, we know that such terms are present, okay, because you have a path integral expression, okay, and manipulating that path integral, of course, you can generate the perturbation expansion through Feynman rules. But you also know that the path integral gets additional contribution from other saddle points, okay, and those are the instant terms. Okay. So we, while we expect that similar contributions should be present in string theory. We don't a priori have a systematic way to compute this okay. because we don't have a path integral formulation. Okay. So we need a non perturbative formulation like path integral. to systematically compute this. Now, unfortunately, right, at present, we do not have a full non perturbative formulation. So, at present, we do not have any one. There are some exceptions, okay, but those are uh, very special okay, in the sense that those are for a very specific background. And let me just list them anyway. Exception for 
specific background. Okay. For example, for some string background, we have a dual matrix model description. Okay, which is a full non perturbative uh, well, you can try to make the matrix model into a non perturbative description of string theory. Okay, although given a matrix model, it does not necessarily imply that you have a full non, non perturbative formulation. ADS CFT certainly is an example where you can try to use dual conformal field theories to give non perturbative formulation. Okay, the uh, uh, most famous example is type 2B string theory on uh, ADS 5 times S5, which is given by a dual Young Mills theory. Or in some cases, even though you do not have the full non perturbative uh, control, we can use S duality to get some insight into the non perturbative effects. Okay. But these apply for very specific backgrounds. Okay. For a generic background, we do not know how to define string theory non perturbatively I have a question. Yes. Uh, is it known, uh, this A n, how do they be, uh, behave for large n? Typically, we expect them to be uh, an asymptotic series. Right? So they are not borderly summable. We do not expect them to be borderly summable. They are poles in the, on the uh, real axis. So that is that's the general expectation. Is it an expectation or is it calculable in some, uh, in some Well, cases? see, what people do calculate is the growth of the volume of the moduli space, right? Now, that's just one um, aspect, right? I mean, we are not, uh, and the full amplitude involves also correlation functions. And those are harder to calculate, right? So the estimate that one makes is just how, uh, how fast the volume of the moduli space grows, right? And it's based on that we expect this to be not borel summable. Okay, so these are some of the shortcomings of the current formulation of string theory. Nevertheless, it turns out that there is one class of effects, one class of non perturbative effects that we can compute in a wide class of backgrounds. So, despite the shortcomings, there is one class of non perturbative effects. that can be studied systematically. Yeah, these are the re instanton effects. Okay, and I will describe what these are. Okay. So, these give additional contribution to the amplitudes besides the perturbative contribution. So, these gives additional contributions. Okay. 
And the general form of these additional contribution is, let me write down the general form first. So first, okay, let me first level this. So this is a constant. This beta is also a constant. And these bns are, these are functions of the quantum numbers of external states, just like the ans. And these are also given, just like the ANs, these are also given by integrals over moduli space of Riemann surfaces, but this time the Riemann surfaces also have has boundaries. So first, you see that because of the C to the minus C over GS, if we try to do a Taylor series expansion of this around GS equal to 0, every term in the Taylor series expansion will vanish. Because if you take derivatives of C to the minus C over GS, however many derivatives you take, and evaluate it at, G, at GS equal to 0, the result is just 0, okay, if you go from the positive side. So this is the reason why you don't see this. This is distinct from the perturbation expansion. The second difference is that the power of GS, beta is a fixed constant for a given amplitude, but the power of GS, you see there it is coming as powers of GS square, here it's a power of GS. Okay, so this is some of the, these are some of the differences that happen, that, that happen between the perturbative contribution and the non-perturbative contribution. But the main, yes. For D in centons, it is this. Right? With only one unique coefficient. Uh, with one? Uh, with just uh, one coefficient C. I, I mean, there cannot be any other uh, uh, coefficient like 2C, 3C. So there or, be, yeah. Because there may be different kinds of D in centons or multi D in centons, mm -hmm. right? But it's always some constant, right? It's not that there is only sing a single co contribution of this kind, mm -hmm. right? There will be other contributions of C prime, uh -huh. right? Or 2C, as you said. Okay? So those are certainly there. Nice. For a given D in centon, this is a con uh, uh, the uh, kind of contribution one gets. Thanks. So the main problem, and this is what distinguishes a d instant on contribution from perturbative contribution,
Okay, they simply look like infinite integrals. Okay, and I'll just write down some examples. So some examples we encountered. So we'll see in our discussion later that we have an integral like this. This integral is finite at t as at t equal to 0 because at, as t goes to 0, this vanishes. Okay. But clearly, it's divergent from t equal to, goes to infinity n, right? This diverges exponentially, this diverges logarithmically. Another example is Okay, this integral you can see diverges from the y equal to 0 n. Right? This is 1 over dy over y square, or this gives you dy over y. Right? Both are divergent. Here is a more complicated example a double integral. The omegas are just constants, okay? The omega 1, omega 2, omega, these are just constants. Okay. But the, uh, 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 what I want to draw your attention to is that these integrals are also divergent, both from the v equal to 0 end, you can see that there are divergent integrals, and from the x equal to 0 end. Okay. So when I said that we have algorithm to compute bns, okay. we have algorithm to write bns as integrals. Okay, and these integrals come from integrals about the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. Okay. But these integrals are divergent, and the main issue is how to deal with these divergences. Okay, so the, this is this will be the main goal of these lectures. is to extract unambiguous finite answers from them. So let me write down the answers that we will get eventually, right? But this is just I'm writing down the answers right now, and the, you know, I mean, during the course of the lectures, I'll explain how these answers come. This integral, for example, we'll see, will give you i over 4 pi square. This will be minus half. And this will be minus half omega square log 4. Okay, so these will, will be seen in the lectures. Will be seen during the lectures. Okay, I'm just writing down these answers because we so that we know what we are aiming for, right? We really want to get 
finite answers out of these integrals because these are the integrals that enter the expressions for these bns. Okay. And unless we can get finite answers out of this, we cannot claim that we have understood the n-centons. Okay. Are there questions? Yes. The n dependence? Yes, so these are for low values of n, right? As you go to higher and higher values of n, you get more and more complicated integrals. So n dependence, I mean, this is for specific n that I have written down. Okay. Because higher n will mean there will be multi-dimensional integrals. The number of integ integrated variables themselves will become larger. Okay. And the integral and the divergence will also become more complicated. Is that okay? Any other question? Now we'll also be able to test this procedure, although I may not discuss it in these lectures, okay, but we can test this. So test. Will be that whenever a dual description exists, Namely that I, we use the procedure to get a result like this. Okay. But then I say that in some cases, we also have dual description, okay, which is a non perturbative description that allows you to calculate uh, these coefficients. Okay. So if we do have a dual description, then it better be that whatever result we get by using this algorithm to extract finite answers out of these, agree with what we get from the dual description. Okay. So this is the test that uh, we can perform. So are these dual descriptions always unambiguous or do you also sometimes sort out an ambiguity in a dual description? Yeah, sometimes you sort out an ambiguity in the dual description, but sometimes it's also yeah, unambiguous, right? For example, the uh, is duality in type 2B, right, gives quite an un unambiguous prediction of what the uh, instant correction should be and we can, we can check against that, right? Matrix models sometimes have ambiguities, right, and you can sort out those ambiguities using both sides. Right, so in other words, the formalism that you are going to describe has no ambiguities whatsoever. That's right, yeah. This has no ambiguity whatsoever. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the only ambiguity in this formalism is what we have in a quantum field theory that we have to, if this, is, this ambiguity exists even in path integral. That when you write a path integral, you give the action and you have to specify an integration contour. Right? That integration contour you choose based on very, very, very physical inputs. Right? But if you change the integration contour, you may get a different result for the path integral. Right? So that ambiguity is always there and that will also be present in this case. But that will be the only ambiguity that we will have. You, you, you said that this is one, cla one class of uh, non-perturbative effects uh, and it is associated to um, some specific backgrounds. Uh, so which kind of backgrounds we are talking about and why this class is special with respect to other non-perturbative effects? 
Okay, so the backgrounds that we are talking about are type 2 uh, string compact equation, type 2 are bosonic. I mean, where the world sheet is left right symmetric, right? For example, the heterotic string theory doesn't have the incentons, okay, or any difference, for example. But when you do have non perturbative effects, okay, these are the leading non perturbative effects. Because the other non perturbative effects, the usual incentons have e to the minus c over g s square, okay, which are subdominant compared to this. So when the incentons pre are present, they are the uh, uh, dominant non perturbative corrections. So, so it's very important that uh, the n appears with the uh, coefficient one. What appears with the, the n in the in the perturbative expansion? This one, no, not this. Okay, this this is related to this, but the important point is that he, the power of gs here is e to the minus c over okay. gs and not c over gs square. Right? The usual incentons have e to the minus c over gs square, so that's why they are more suppressed in the gs goes to zero limit. Okay, now before I go on, let me ask one question that is often asked in this context. Okay, and I suspect that this question has also been asked already. And that is the following. That does it make sense to compute instant on corrections Because as you saw, the perturbative series has this structure, sum over n g s to the power 2 n plus alpha. And clearly, every term here in this expansion is in the small g s limit is larger than this one. Okay, so one may ask, is it, does it make sense to talk about instant corrections before we even sum the perturbation series? So here, I will try to give two answers which one is practical, but one is more uh, conceptual. So the practical answer is that for many quantities, so practical answer, that for many quantities, So in such cases, clearly it makes sense to talk about Dean standard corrections because the perturbative contrib contribution is completely understood, right? It, it either is not there at all, okay? For, this happens, for example, in, in the computation of certain terms in the superpotential, right? So certain kind of terms, if you take an n equal to one supersymmetric compactification in four to four dimensions, okay, then certain class of terms are simply not generated in perturbation theory, and they are the Dean standards often are the leading contribution to such terms. 
right? So there it certainly makes sense to talk about the instant and contribution. In type 2B theory in 10 dimensions, okay, there are perturbative contribution to certain amplitudes, but those series terminate, right? Either up to, after one order up to uh, uh, second order, all hard terms vanish. Okay, so then the perturbative contribution is completely understood and then the d incentons are the next leading corrections. Okay. So in such cases, clearly there is justification of why you want to study d incenton effects. Okay. There are also examples without supersymmetry, by the way. Right? There are, you know, we'll study this C equal to one bosonic strength theory in uh, some detail. Okay. And there we'll see that the uh, uh, certain amplitudes have imaginary part, and the imaginary part doesn't receive any contribution from the perturbative uh, series. Right? So they are d incentons are the leading contribution to the imaginary part of the amplitude. Okay. So there are examples of this kind. Okay. So this is a practical answer. Okay. But there is also a conceptual answer, and that is the following. So in QFT, for example, instantons, QFT includes quantum mechanics. Right? Instantons are subdominant saddles in the path integral. Okay, they are subdominant in the sense that their contribution is exponentially suppressed compared to the leading contribution, which is what the perturbative uh, contribution is. Okay. And the instant on amplitudes give the contribution to the amplitude from the steepest descent contour of the path, steepest descent contour of the saddle. So in the field space, if we think of the location of the various saddle points, okay, so in the field space there may be various saddle points, this is a perturbative this is the instant on one, this is the instant on two. Etc. And then for each of these saddles, there is a steepest descent contour. Right? Then the, in higher dimension, the generalization of steepest descent contour is what are called left set symbols. Okay. But there are some surfaces, some subspaces, okay, along which in the in this is in the complex field space. Okay, you always draw the steepest descent contour in the complex field space. So there are some subspaces that pass through these saddles. And when you talk about the instant and contribution to the amplitude, okay, what it is computing in perturbation theory is the result of the integral on those surfaces, those steepest descent contours. Okay. So it is true that if the steepest descent contour of the perturbative saddle gives much larger contribution compared to the steepest descent contour of the instant and contour, uh, saddle. Okay. Nevertheless, it certainly makes sense to ask okay, 
what is the result of the steepest descent contour through the insert all, right? In the field space, if I specify a contour, I can ask what is the result of that integral, right? And that's what the instant and contribution computes. So it's an interesting quantity by itself, okay? Even though the actual integration contour may be involving both perturbative and some of the instant and uh, saddles, and then this one may, one may dominate. But if you had chosen the inti integration contour to be the steepest descent contour of the instanton, then instanton amplitudes are all that you'll get. Now, in string theory, of course, you don't have a path integral description, fundamental path integral description. But one expects that there should be a similar interpretation also in string theory. So when you say that you are trying to compute the instanton amplitudes in string theory, okay, effectively you are computing the integral result of path integral, okay, whatever that may be the result of path integral over certain contour, right, which passes through these uh, non perturbative saddles. Okay. And the fact that they are dominated by the, con the perturbative contour, okay, we do not need to take into account, right? It, this is a quantity that, you, that is of interest by itself. What is the result of the integral over this steep edge descent contour of a given saddle? Okay. So that's a more conceptual reason why the instant and amp contribution to the amplitudes are useful quantities to study, okay. even if in practice they may give the subdominant contribution. Questions? Sorry, uh, in quantum field theory we also have some other uh, non perturbative contributions which has no such interpretation like uh, renormalons. Okay. How, how do you know that this the instanton says no, this uh, are not of this kind? Well, I think we know it because of this uh, uh, fact that you have this e to the minus c over gs suppression, right? And this is typically the signal that there is a, uh, 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 that, uh, that there is a saddle whose, whose action is c over gs. Okay, and in fact, we can explicitly identify these saddles as d blends. So in that sense, I mean, you already know that there exist saddles, right? Even though we don't have a path integral description, we, in string theory, we can identify uh, uh, solutions to equations of motion, okay, just by saying that they are conformal field theories, right? So in that sense, you already know that there are saddles with action of this kind, okay? So it's more natural to interpret the dean standard contribution as coming from the steep adjacent contour of the saddles. Any other question? Okay, so let me then say what the instant turns are. And here I assume that you have some idea of what D-brains are, okay, because D instantons are special kind of D-brains. So D instantons okay, and I'll use the no, what D instanton is a somewhat generalized sense. So we'll define the instantons as the follows as the following. These are D blends. With with Dirichlet boundary condition along all non compact directions. including time, okay? And we normally describe the instantons in the Euclidean space time, so in the Euclidean time. Okay. So in, the, in order to describe a deep end, you have to specify for each space time direction whether you impose a Dirichlet or Neumann boundary condition, okay? Sometimes you may also consider mixed 
boundary condition, but let's just uh, do Dirichlet and Neumann. So for each space-time direction, you have to specify whether you are considering Dirichlet or Neumann boundary condition. Okay. Here the idea is that along all the non-compact directions, you have to put Dirichlet boundary condition. Along the compact space-time directions, you may put Neumann or Dirichlet. Okay, all, all of those will be classified as D instantons, different kinds of D instantons. Okay. But because you are putting the Dirichlet boundary condition on the non-compact direction, this means that these are localized along all non-compact directions. Okay, in particular, it's localized at some particular value of time. <coughs> and because these are localized along all non-compact directions, what they describe as finite action solutions in strength theory. Okay, and the action is has a form, some constant over Gs. Okay. And this follows from the standard argument that all D blends, okay, the tension of a D blend it goes as one over G string, some constant over G string. At right, the same argument, it goes as so tension here goes uh, over to action because it's also localized in the time direction. Okay. And the standard calculation that you can find in Polchinski's book can be used to calculate the C, these coefficients. Okay. So the action of the D instanton you can compute. Given, uh, uh, once you specify whether the, what boundary condition you're imposing on which direction, you can explicitly compute the action of the D instanton following the standard uh, technique. So it is in this sense that D instantons are genuine saddles of string theory, right? Even though we don't know what path integral describes uh, uh, string computation. So these are analogous to instantons in quantum field theory. And except that in normal instantons in quantum field theory, we'll have a G squared. Right, the action typically goes as 1 over g square. Here it goes as 1 over g. Right, that's the main difference. Okay. And this gives non perturbative contribution to string amplitudes. Okay, these amplitudes, as I have already written, takes the form e to the minus c over gs and bn gs to the power n plus beta. Okay. And these okay, are what are given by integrals over the moduli spaces of Riemann surfaces with boundaries. Okay. Why with boundaries? Because once you have d blend, right, you have open strings which end on d blends, right, and the open string world sheets have boundaries. Okay, that's the reason why the d instanton amplitudes have boundaries, the world sheets have boundaries. Now, in these lectures, we'll consider single d instantons. But that's just for simplicity. Okay. 
Okay, the procedure that I'll be describing can also be generalized to multiple D instantons. Okay, it just requires a little more work. For multiple instantons, suppose there are n instantons, the first difference will be that there will be e to the minus n c over g s. Okay, because there are n instantons, total action is n c over g s. And then these cal the calculation of b n will be a little more complicated, right? Because there are, there's, you know, the boundary can ha now have different boundary conditions because it can end on the first d instanton or the second d instanton or the third d instanton and so on. So now let me give some systematics of d instanton amplitudes, okay, because this will be important. So first, we now have, we have open and closed strings in the presence of the instantons. So if you think of D instanton as a point in space time, okay, at least along the, the non-compact directions, it may have extension in the compact directions, which I have not drawn. Okay. Then there can certainly be open strings whose ends are on the D instanton. Okay, so these are open strings. But we can also have closed strings in the vicinity of the D instantons, right, or far away from the D instantons. So both of those kinds of strings are present. But there is a cru crucial difference between the open strings and the closed strings. Okay. Namely, the open strings, okay, these exist only for limited time. Because D instantons are localized in time. Right? They occur at some particular value of time. And because the ends of the open string are tied to the D instanton, right, the open strings cannot extend, the world volume of the open string, or the world sheet of the open string cannot extend you know, too much in the time direction. Right? It has to be confined in the vicinity of this, the, where the D instanton is located. Okay. So because of this, okay, these cannot be asymptotic states. These are not asymptotic states. So the interpretation of the open strings is that if the D instantons are localized, yes, go ahead. It, sorry, just a quick clarification um, conceptually. So of course the instanton is perfectly localized in time. So when you say limited time, do you mean because they also will have a finite energy excitation so you can have, you can allow a vicinity also in time? Or do you actually mean they just exist for one instant in time? Well, D instantons exist for one instant of time. But the open string, of course, the middle of the open string can uh, extend in time. That's, it's a, it cannot, they cannot go very far away from the time. Right? That, they will cost infinite energy. energy or, yeah, yeah, that was my question. Yeah. So it is related to finite energy. That's right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That you, you, you have to stretch it too much in time, right? That's like infinite tension. So open strings are not asymptotic states. So when you talk about D instant on amplitudes, okay, the external states whose scattering amplitude we calculate okay, are always closed strings. Okay, it's just like normal instantons in quantum field theory. Right? If you take instantons in quantum field theory, 
what do they compute? They compute the usual scattering amplitude of the uh, excitations of the, of the quantum field theory. Right? The instantons have their own modes. Right? The instantons can get translated, it can vibrate, it can do various things. Okay? But those are not the state, uh, modes whose scattering amplitude we, call, we call, calculate. Right? Those modes are useful in computing scattering amplitudes of the external states, which are the usual uh, 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 states of quantum field theory. Okay? So here, they are in the same spirit. Open strings are describing the dynamics of the d instanton, okay? but they are not uh, asymptotic states. So when you talk about scattering amplitudes, the external states will always be closed strings. Okay? This is something we should keep in mind. Is it okay? Are there questions on this? The second important point, okay, which is again uh, different from the usual perturbative di uh, perturbation theory, is that because we are imposing Dirichlet boundary condition. Okay, we have the internal located at a particular time, for example, right? So time transition invariance is broken. It's located at some particular value of the space coordinate. So the space transition invariance is broken. And because this transition invariance is broken, that means that there is no energy momentum conservation. by the usual wall sheets. Okay, these are the wall sheets with boundaries because it's the boundaries which break the transition invariance. Okay. Eventually, of course, we'll see how the uh, transition invariance is restored, how the energy momentum conservation is restored. Okay. But at the level of Computation, okay, when you do the, the standard string calculation, okay, transition invariance is broken and hence we don't have energy momentum conservation. And this has a non trivial consequence, okay, namely that now disconnected wall sheets okay, are on the same footing as connected wall sheets. Okay. You think in terms of quantum field theory Feynman diagrams. When you draw Feynman diagrams in quantum field theory, we have both disconnected and connected diagrams. Right? In QFT, if you are doing four point scattering, you can draw four point scattering diagrams like this, okay? or you can have four point scattering diagrams like this. Okay? This is disconnected, this is connected. Normally, the reason that we don't worry about these okay, is because these diagrams require additional energy momentum conservation than the overall energy momentum conservation. Right? This one, for example, will tell us that the energy momentum of this should be equal to the energy momentum of this, and energy momentum of this should be equal to energy momentum ten, uh, uh, of this, okay? which means there are two separate energy momentum conservations right? that have to be satisfied for this diagram. Whereas for this diagram, there is only one overall energy momentum conservation. So if we take a generic external momenta, right, which satisfies just that overall energy momentum conservation, 
then typically for generic external momentum, this diagram will not contribute because the delta function constant will not be satisfied. Otherwise, in quantum field theory, these diagrams are there. And similarly, in string theory also, disconnected worksheets are very much present. But because Dean Sentons don't have this feature that individual worksheets satisfy energy momentum conservation, okay, they are in no way different from the standard worksheets which are connected. Right? So you have to include all of them. So in for the instant on amplitudes, we need to include these connected wall sheets. When, when you say that translation invariance uh, is broken, you mean uh, spontaneously broken, right? The time translation and also the space start translation are in non compact directions. Yes, okay. I mean, from, from the point of view of worksheet, uh, it is a, a, you are choosing a, a different volume in which uh, the translation invariance is, uh, is spontaneously broken. Is, is it correct? Well, I would not say the spontaneously broken, it's just there's a boundary. Right? And at the boundary, the energy is not conserved. Right? It can just flow out of the boundary. Or the momentum is not conserved. That's what is happening. Mm. Right? Because at the boundary, you don't, the boundary is the one which is breaking translation invariance. Right? So it's, I would say it's more explicitly broken because you have just broken it by putting this boundary condition on the wall sheet. But keeping into account that the, the instantons are, um, are dynamical object, uh, in the full theory, the translation invariance will be restored. Yes, yes, it will be restored eventually. Right? But at the level of individual watches, they will not be restored. <laughs> we'll see later how the full translation invariance is restored. But individual watches don't have that property. OK. So now, let me describe how to organize the Dean Stanton uh, uh, amplitudes. OK, because you want to do this power series, right? Which are the ones which give dominant contribution in this power series? Okay. And here, we are going to use the usual rules of string perturbation theory. Okay. And that is the fo uh, following, that wall sheet with Euler number chi gives contribution of order gs to the minus chi. OK, that's the standard rule in string perturbation theory, and that holds even for in the presence of the instant terms. So this means that in order to get the highest negative power of GS, that means lowest 10 in this expansion, <coughs> we have to maximize the Euler character, Euler number. And this is, OK, so how do you maximize Euler number? Okay. Disks have Euler number 1. The sphere, of course, have more. But sphere has no boundaries. Okay. So we are looking for surfaces with boundaries, right? Because those are there, we can also explore the fact that the energy momentum is not concept. Annulus, okay, annulus is 
this topologically, right? A disk with a hole. This has Euler number zero. Okay, and then you can list various other things, but these are the ones which have low Euler number. Sorry, high Euler number. Okay, others there are also many surfaces with negative Euler number. So because of this fact that the disks of order number one, we see that the way to get the maximum inverse power of GS is to maximize the number of disks. So to get the leading contribution, we need to maximize the number of disks. So this is the first observation. Second observation is that because annulus has order number zero, In respect to how many oil and, uh, how many annulus you use, right, the power of GS remains the same, right, because it has, is GS to the zero. So we can use, can use as many annulus as you want. As you want, without a cost in GS. A question? Um, yes. Should I uh, should I think of the annulus as a one instant or as two instantons? No, one instanton only because uh, when I say annulus, on both boundaries we will put the same boundary condition. Okay. See, the instanton is just one point in space time, right? The number of strings that can end on it can be anything. Right? So annulus are both ends of the open string are ending on the instanton, right? So it's like you can think of this as a loop. Take this one open string, and it's a loop of that open string. So the instant on action is still one over GS. It's not yes, two it's, over GS. No, it's not two over GS. It's still one over GS. Right? Because if given a single instant on, you can have as many wall sheets as you want ending on that. Because those are different excitations of the same instant on. So the leading contribution, okay, we can, with this we can add, write down the leading contribution. Okay. So the leading contribution has the following structure. We have this exponential of minus c over gs, which is the suppression due to the action. Okay. Then we have the exponential of the annulus. Okay, because you can use as many as you want. So you can use 0 or 1 or 2, et cetera. And the combinatorial factor is such that it just exponentiates. And then we have a product of these quant point functions. So these are the closed string vertex operators. So you have n closed strings, right? The idea is that you take n disks, insert one closed string on each of these disks. So you cannot have disk without a uh, vertex of order because that vanishes, right? Because of this, uh, there is a SL2 or volume you have to divide by, and that makes a disk without vertex of order vanish. So you have to insert at least one vertex of order. So you maximize the number of disks by inserting each external vertex of order on one disk. Is this clear? Right? So, yes. Yeah. Um, maybe you could say a couple more words why this exponentiates exactly if you have an arbitrary number of boundaries but you tie them up to annuli. 
I mean, you said that combinatorics works out, but it's maybe not obvious that it does. Yeah, OK. Basically, OK. So first of all, one corresponds to no annulus right, in the expansion. Okay. Then you can have one annulus. Okay. For the two annulus, well, I don't know whether I can do it uh, often. Uh, basically, there is a one over two factorial because the exchange of these two annulus right, gives the same diagram. Right? That's, that's the uh, 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 argument. Right? And you can repeat this for any annulus. Right? But I think if you want more details of this, I have to work it out uh, I mean, uh, and then tell you. Right? I don't want to do it <laughs> right now on this spot. Okay? But roughly that's the idea, that when you have multiple annulus, there is an exchange symmetry. Right? That gives the 1 over n factorial, and that's why it exponentiates. So this exponential basically comes from these all, all of these. Yeah, it's roughly that, exactly, yeah. It's like a zero point function in quantum field theory. Uh, so so uh, are there uh, fermionic zero modes that you have to soak up? I mean, do you have yeah, to? Yeah, yeah. So if there are fermionic zero modes, you have to do a little more work, right? So this is a leading contribution provided the answer is non zero, right? I mean, it may happen that in some cases this answer is zero, right? Then you have to look for the what is the, uh, 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 what is the first non zero contribution. So, so we'll discuss the fermion zero modes, but certainly if there are fermionic zero modes, you have to insert them appropriately. So next order, for the leading order, there's nothing else, right? This is all you have. At the next order, what you can do, okay, there are many ways you can increase powers of GS, right? You want to pre increase the power of GS by one. So what we can do is we can give up one disk. So instead of having each, that each disk having one closed string vertex operator, maybe one disk has two, and the rest have one. So here is a possible contribution at next order. Okay, so this basically means that we have one less disk, so you lose a factor of GS. Right? Because on one of the disks, we insert two bar closed string vertex operators, so we are Using a disk. So this is one contribution, but there are others at the same order. Okay. You can have this. You can replace a disk by an annulus. So all of them are disks except that one disk is replaced by an annulus compared to the, this diagram over here. Right? So again, you lose 1 over gs because this instead of being 1 over gs is a power 1. Or you can do you have these as if before, but then you add to this a disk with two holes. Okay, a disk with two holes have oil character minus one. This has chi equal to minus one. Okay, so because of this we lose a factor of G S, right? It's G S to the minus k. I, so you just get a factor of GS. So these are the various ways we can build the diagrams. Okay. Is are there questions? Now the problem comes. Because most of these diagrams are divergent. Okay, this could one, this one point function is okay. Okay, that's in fact the only one which is finite. 
But this one, for example, is infinite. We'll write down the res result for this next time for some theories. Okay? This is infinite. Okay, and the question is, what do we do about this? These are both infinite. This two-point function, annulus one-point function, are all infinite. Okay, they, uh, and the, some of the integrals I showed you essentially come from this. So we have to understand what the origin of these infinities are, and then understand how to extract finite result out of these infinities. Okay, so that will be the uh, goal of this next two lectures. Okay, I think my time is up, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Um, we can have some questions or comments or 